What's up, everybody? Welcome to Send It, the official blockchain and cryptocurrency podcast by OKX Insights. I'm your host, Adam, and I'm joined today by FBI Femboy. You may know him on Twitter. Um, let's get started by having you introduce yourself. Um, oh, and, and for listeners and v- any viewers on YouTube, today it's just going to be me and FBI, um, Maxwell, and maybe Olivia, and um, and Rick will be joining us maybe uh, on the next episode. But for this one, it's just going to be a conversation between me and FBI. So, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself to um, any listeners. Hi. Um, yeah, so as, as you said, I'm FBI Femboy. It's, it's a pleasure to be on this podcast. So thank you for the generous invitation. Uh, what, let's say, I suppose it's, it's unclear where to start. Um, you know, as far as employment goes, I currently, as of about a month ago, I joined CropSwap as a principal researcher. Um, overall, I'm I'm pretty new to crypto, having only really been in this space for uh, several months, really. But you know, I've been blessed to meet quite a large, quite a large number of very, very helpful and, and very, um, very kind people who have helped me uh, in my journey so far. So here I am, I suppose. Cool. Yeah, I I didn't know that about you until I listened to the um, your recent podcast you did with um, Mitsuke, right? Uh, Kitsune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't realize that you were such a newcomer in the space. To be honest, I assumed um, in the beginning that you were an anonymous account for somebody else. Well, I could be. I mean, that's what I would say if I were trying to hide my identity, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. So. Let's let's kick off with that topic then. So as a newcomer, like you've made a name for yourself, I would say on crypto Twitter like pretty quickly. Um and for somebody else who's like new into the space and who is like let's say they're more than just well heck, even if they're just like your average kind of like speculator, like retail speculator or something, but they're like really into crypto, they want to have a presence on crypto Twitter, that sort of stuff. What what kind of advice would you give? Like considering you, you know, you became relatively popular pretty quickly, um, and you, and now you're at CrocSwap and whatnot. Um, do you have any advice for somebody who's looking to like get into the space, sort of like now? Sure. Well, I, I think that's really quite an interesting question. I, I guess I would say that you know, to the extent that my popularity can be attributed to any sort of you know deliberation or skill, I, I think it has to do with tweets by posts that are. I, I guess based on a relatively realistic understanding of, of crypto, right? Which I think, you know, surprisingly, uh, or perhaps not surprisingly, is not that prevalent in the space. Um, so I guess if I, if I were to give one word, of, of, one word of, of advice to newcomers, it would be to really try to understand things deeply. And I, by deeply, like I, I think it's important to qualify that because people often will go and they'll read the white papers and they'll read substacks and blog posts, and that will be their sense of you know what it under, what it entails to understand some topic of crypto deeply. But I, I think that's in a sense almost missing missing the forest with the trees because if I think about you know what content I post that has been well received, it's not. It's not these things that are super technical. There are very like deep explanations of, of mathematical topics or something. But rather, it's these almost like I. It, it's it's almost when I post like a fairly banal insight that seems kind of obvious to me that people <laughs> and and I just and people you know just sort of enjoy it because people don't like there are a lot of simple truths out there that people simply uh, don't really say. And so if you aren't thinking carefully about what is real and what's not real, then you kind of get psy so to speak, into a version of reality that doesn't really exist. And by simply just keeping your eyes open and, and being having an appropriate level of skepticism about claims that people make, and like I, I think that will get you quite far. Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously, the whole cryptocurrency industry as a whole, let alone crypto Twitter, um, is very a very noisy space, <clears throat> full of obviously like shill, 
full of psyops, full of a lot of shit posting. I mean, if if one's not careful and doesn't sort of curate their feed or their network and whatnot, like things can just get really noisy and somewhat overwhelming. And I do think I do agree that having sort of like quality, thought out sort of takes um, is is important. And I, I find that accounts that do that do tend to rise fairly quickly. Um, I say that as someone who, especially lately, shit posts more than I provide any sort of quality, to be honest. But, but if someone wants quality, you know, they can come to OKX Insights and see what we're doing. Um, but so if I'm not mistaken, your <clears throat> your first, at least how I remember it, your first big sort of thing, like when you got a lot of traction on um, on crypto Twitter was your correct model of Olympus DAO Substack post. Um mm-hmm. And actually, before we get into that, before we get into that, um, what were you doing before crypto? <laughs> That's a good question. I'll, I'll just leave it as uh, working in the tech adjacent industry, I would, I uh-huh. would say. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so getting into a correct model, Olympus DAO, um, we will link this article, we'll link your whole Substack in the description for this YouTube video. But um, what would you... How would you summarize this, right? So this this had a lot of traction. I believe it came out. It wasn't at um, at Ohm's all time high, but it was, I believe, still. I think Ohm had caught like a bounce um, late in the fall. So mm-hmm. I think you know it wasn't. Let's put it this way: it wasn't like thirty dollars like it is now. Yep. Um, so this came out when Ohm was still had a lot of belief, still had a lot of momentum. I think, and I remember it did get quite a bit of buzz on crypto Twitter because it was uh, somewhat of a contrarian model, right, to the popular, like, you know, this mm-hmm. thing going up forever. Um, how would you, what's like the too long didn't read of of this? Like, what can you say about the article? To summarize it very simply, I would say that the reserve currency narrative just doesn't make sense. And in the end, the staking mechanism is like a very complex and obscured form of token emissions, which is not like fundamentally different from like sushi emissions or or urine emissions or whatever. It's just wrapped up in a very complex and somewhat obscured form and given a narrative, which I personally don't think is accurate. I mean, I, I guess to elaborate on that, like, like there, there are two combo, there are two components. There, first is the aspects about you know this framing of Olympus as the decentralized reserve currency, and my argument in that respect is is largely that it doesn't make sense. And you know, I, I noticed that a lot of the pushback I got when I was uh, discussing articles with, with others is that people would be like, "Well, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't criticize them for." experimenting for trying new things in the space of decentralized finance because maybe there's something there maybe, maybe it's valuable to, to experiment and to just simply throw out new mechanisms right and i, I think that's somewhat missing the point in my article because the point of my article is not to say that um we should not have any decentralized reserve currencies or that we should not have decentralized currencies in general or that you know you know people shouldn't try new things i i would certainly disagree with that but rather, I would say that the point was that even if you accept the premise that one wants a decentralized reserve currency, it's not actually clear, you know, if one reads your documentation and one, and one looks literally at the words that they put out, it's not clear that they themselves understand what they've created or what they're doing. And, and I, I go through their documentation and they point out some pretty basic, I think some basic errors and basic misunderstandings, which simply signal to me that this narrative is it, it is really more of like a fantasy or a dream than it is reflective of a serious and well thought out attempt to resolve a well specified problem instead it's kind of like i i mean it's difficult to really say what it is but but it's like you know the claim that it's I mean, you, you can't just, like, throw words at the wall, right, and then claim that you're a decentralized reserve currency. It much like in the, same way, in the same way that, you know, you can't write down random numbers. You can't write, like, you know, 1 plus 2 equals 5 and then claim that you're doing mathematics. Just because you're using the language of mathematics doesn't mean that you're actually doing mathematics seriously. And similarly, just because you throw 
words in there like reserve currency and treasury and, and so on, and you put them together in a somewhat intelligible fashion, it doesn't mean that you've actually scoped out a real problem and that you're addressing it in, in a serious way, just because you're using the vocabulary of the space. And so I think once you put that away, what you end up with is, in practice, a treasury which is being used to yield farm, and then token emissions, which are distributed to the holders in a sort of complex and not dumb standard way. But ultimately, we're talking about emissions, right? So essentially, it's just yield farming at scale, which is kind of weird, right? That for, and it's certainly not clear what that would that would command a premium of you know ten or twenty x um, over backing, so to speak. And as I predicted, you know, at that time, I, I believe Ohm was still several multiples uh, above backing. That the trading was was suggest was you know implying a market capitalization that was several times larger than the treasury. And as I predicted, I, I think it has dropped uh, substantially since then. So I believe, to some extent, at least my um, my claims have been vindicated. Yeah, um, my experience with Ohm, just sort of anecdotally, is that like. I read the documents and it was a similar thing like, yeah, I got it or I got what they were trying to say. But I also like it's not like it clicked like, OK, this makes like 100 percent sense. You know, like I like you said, it was like they were using the language of <laughs> they're using the correct language. But it doesn't necessarily mean that like they knew what they were talking about. I don't want to throw shade. I'm not saying like. Like Zeus and, and those guys don't know what they're talking about, but you know what we're getting at here. Yeah, totally. But, like, like there are people who are saying that they're like scammers, and I think that's wrong. Like, I, like I think you shouldn't just ascribe malicious intentions to people, and like, like I think that's just you know un unnecessary. You know, I I truly believe that they were really trying to create something new, and I truly believe they they saw a problem and they were trying to do what they could to build something to address it. And I think that sort of impulse is, is really quite admirable and we could really use more of that. It's just, uh, at the end of the day, I think it was not a well-considered effort. And I think, and like, and I think that's kind of a problem in crypto in general. I mean, I, I could, you could even say it's a problem in general, you know, personally, it's the major pet peeve of mine when people just throw words together and, and it's sort of clear that they're doing so in this sort of imitative fashion where it, it, they haven't actually thought about whether the a sum total of the words that they're putting together makes sense as like a coherent sentence, right? But, you know, I, I don't know, that's the sort of the state of, uh, the, state of the world as it is. Well, I must yeah. Like sort of an angry old boomer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to unpack this a little bit more too, so... Looking at more at Olympus Dow, so the other big aspect here, which is why I ultimately took the trade, and the trade did work for me, but the reason I, I took the trade was because the, not because of what they were trying to do, that might have been like a small part of the decision, but the concerted effort to meme this thing, like, to the moon, so to speak. So, I mean, Olympus did a very, very, very good job of memeing it, right, with 3-3. Yep. And that ultimately, I mean, they did a good job of getting traction on, like, in our little bubble, sort of on crypto Twitter and whatnot. Yep. I mean, it caught my attention and stuff. And then ultimately, I think that did seep over into the wider kind of, like, retail space um, when it really took off and sort of hit a top. Mm -hmm. And then we started to see articles come out about it like um mm -hmm. like andrew thurman from coindesk wrote a good one before that we wrote one at okx insights a link in the description um from our own rick delaney which is really quite good um but that this goes to sh something that i think i want to discuss with you as well and that's like so moving one step past olympus then and the memeing then we get to olympus forks which became right. its own sort of, as Kobe said, like its own meta um, afterwards. And the Olympus Forks, I think it's, it's more safe to say that these things were really not well thought out efforts and that they were um, kind of like money grabs. And I think, 
I think this is where it starts to get more disingenuous because people, this is where I think people start to hide behind mm-hmm. the, oh, well, we're trying to do something new. We're trying to experiment with something. Or in the case of a fork, right, we're trying to iterate on this idea or we're trying to improve this idea. But anybody can say that, right? Anybody with, with the dev skills or whatever, they yep. can say that they're trying to iterate on something or improve something or, or create something new or experiment or whatever. But at yep. the end of the day, somebody's going to make money from other people off of that experiment that that nine times, if not 99 times out of 100, is going to fail. Mm-hmm. Like, and just be lost into obscurity, you know, as the years roll on. So, yeah, I mean, what's your take on that? that that's a good question. I mean, you know, as far as own forks go, um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So, I actually, it was about the time when I uh, joined crypto that own forks are starting to take off and and although i didn't really personally um play around with them all, all, all too much i mean because i I'm, I'm kind of a really horrible trader as i as I mentioned on my podcast with kitsune so so in general i just try to so it is it's i mean just a bit of an aside but i generally just hold hold major coins and, and refrain from aping into anything too weird um, but I, I, I observed them quite closely because I thought, cause I thought it was quite interesting. And at that point, I was still trying to think, okay, like, does this model actually make sense? Like, you know, this is really big, right? So, so maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something really valuable about Olympus that I'm missing. And so I kept a pretty close eye on, on Wonderland and on these, all of these new forks as well, like Exodia. And I try to think, okay, like, is there some value here that I'm not seeing? You know, it, like, is, is there, is there something real here? Like, what's, what value is being created? And I thought it, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, but ultimately, as you say, I, I think it's true that these were all essentially cash grabs. And, you know, when you talk about intentions, I think that's a funny thing, right? Like, like people may not come into something with the intention of making a crap. Like, no one thinks to themselves, or at least very few people think, this, think to this themselves, I'm going to make this project as a cash grab, right? I think that's a very unpleasant thing to think, and I think people generally shy away from thinking it. However, people will naturally observe, like, there's a lot of liquidity in this space, and they'll come up with a reason which is plausible to themselves why it makes sense to create a fork or a new project or some, you know, clone of a protocol in general, right? Like, like they come up with, with some sort of internal rationalization. And I think that's probably what happened. People see that Omen Forks make a lot of money. People see that Omen Self is making a lot of money. And so they almost sigh off themselves into believing that the model makes sense. And they construct some version of that narrative which makes sense in their mind. And they, and they promote it um, to people who buy into the fork. Um, so that's kind of my model of, of what happened, of what happened there. Um, I, I do agree it was all pretty much, you know, like, like I, fundamentally, I don't really think they're like qualitatively different from like dog coins, like Shiba or, or, or Dog, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, so I've been around in the industry, I guess, for like half a decade now. And it's like, we've seen this. This is, I mean, this formula has always been the case, right? So, you know, back in the old days, the OG days and stuff, they, before I was in and everything, there was like, um, it was like the mining game, you know, like mining whatever random, right. you know, Bitcoin. Because there, there wasn't like that many coins to choose from. So like that was the game of like being the, being early to mine and then dump. Um, and if you talk to any old miners from the time, they know that no one believed in any of this stuff they were mining, you know, and it just got progressively worse and worse and worse. Um, then we got to, you know, sort of like Bitcoin forks Mm -hmm. and, and it's like the level of, of like maybe positive intention, it sort of decreases with each, with each step. So, you know, people can be a Bitcoin cash hater and all that stuff and that's fine. And I certainly was as well. But I mean, I think that like Bitcoin cash aside from the people who were involved. I mean, they certainly had a a vested interest, but Bitcoin Cash, you know, it came about at a time when, like, you couldn't even move Bitcoin because it was so Mm -hmm. prohibitively slow and expensive because Mm -hmm. um, Segwit hadn't been implemented yet. It was just, it was bad. And Bitcoin Mm -hmm. Cash actually filled a need at that time because you could, if you wanted to move funds across exchange, for example, you could use Bitcoin Cash to do it, and it was, like, way faster, or Litecoin, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But 
but then you know you get to like all these like totally random bitcoin forks that are just like total garbage and i mean absolute cash grabs like nobody with each step it got worse to the point where it's like you there was not even any effort to like act like this was something that was uh like <laughs> legitimate right. and then you and this has always played out and then you had the ico game and all this stuff you know but then going into today you have um we'll, we'll use ohm forks again as an example of one of these it's like I think with each progressive ohm fork, it just gets more cash grabby. Um, right. I'm going to pick on maybe Arby's Finance as an example here. I don't, <laughs> I don't even remember who actually was involved. Who was involved? In that, so I, I don't know. Lay on that one. <laughs> I hope nobody gets mad at me or whatever. It's just my own opinions. <laughs> but like Arby's is an example. I'm just going to say like I, I don't know what like the actual like iteration or positive or like. I don't, I don't know what the pure intention here was because it was like, first of all, it's called Arby's Finance, as in like the fast food restaurant for those who don't have Arby's in their country. I'm not sure Arby's is even outside of the United States. Um, and then it was using like, you know, zero to all over for the memes and everything. It was, and just to attract people to get like high yields and then, and then, you know, it just falls down. But I think taking this a step further it's always about who's involved in one of things, these things first. And the earlier you are, the more you, know, you get the reward that then you can dump on latecomers. I mean, that's always been the play all the way back to the OG mining days, you know, whatever. That's always been the play. And in the case of Ohm Forks, I think that was the play as well. And maybe if we want to get even more critical, it's kind, it was kind of the play with Ohm too, because if you were in Ohm real early, I'm not going to name names, but there's people on crypto Twitter we know who were in Ohm real early. And, like, you cannot tell me that they're still holding their bags. Like, maybe to a certain degree, but you cannot tell me these people were not cashing out as this thing went up. Oh, yeah. Uh Yeah. And some of these people were very, were, like, responsible, you know, for memeing the 3-3, like, in the very beginning and promoting it, like I would say downright straight up promoting it. And I don't mean that in a, like, a paid promotion sense, but very much beating the drum about why this is great without ever maybe really explaining yep. why it's great. Um, so they, I guess that was a bit of a rant, <laughs> but that's yeah, I, like... I mean, yeah, I, I guess my thoughts on that, you know, I just started to cut you off, but like this, like it's an, inter- it's an interesting question. Like, like let's say you're in that position, you know, what, what, what do you do? Like you can pump your bags by meaning this free free thing, or you can stay quiet about it and just move some later. And it's, I know, like, it, it touches on a broader question, which is, you know, the extent to which it's moral to use your followers as the ex- liquidity, which, like, on, on one hand, I agree that in an abstract sense, it's, like, I, I would like to live in a world where people don't do this, where people don't implicitly use her followers as ex- liquidity. On the other hand, like, from their perspective, I kind of understand it, even in the worst case, like, like, you know, we're talking like if if you're truly an early Omi, if you really get in something early, um, by drumming up a lot of publicity, especially if you have a lot of pre-existing followers, you can actually you can literally secure financial independence, not just for yourself, but also for your family, for your loved ones, uh, for your lineage, even for your friends. And so I I like I understand it. You know, like that's actually a very compelling trade-off. Like. And at the end of the day, if you ask me if I care more about, you know, the, the very small number of people who I would consider very close to me, if I care more about them or about the f- people who, the random people who follow me on Twitter, like, like obviously, you know, I'm not a sociopath, and so obviously I would say I care more about the people who are close to me, nearly by definition. Um, so, you know, if... <laughs> like, like, like you, you, see the, the, you see the dilemma here, right? Like, I understand that on one hand, it, it would really be lovely to have a world where no one uses other people's excellent liquidity, and we're all quite sensibly minded about all of this. At the same time, you know, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. Like, thankfully, I'm not in a position to actually have to have to face this dilemma myself because I, I'm not really an insider in anything. To be honest, no one gives me. I, I don't have any alpha, and I don't really. I ultimately, I'm typically the one dumps on rather than the one dumping, but. You know, I, I can't really bring it in myself to say that these people are categorically or universally doing something that's wrong or bad, 
right? They they truly are making like this. This truly is something that can make a real difference in people's lives, and especially if people are coming from a background where they don't necessarily have financial security, or you know, the kind of factual is them like working a minimum wage job or something, right? Like that's life changing, and you know, I, I I can't say that if I were in their positions, I would do something different. You know, I, I would like to say, uh, obviously, I would like to say that I wouldn't do that, but I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. There's, I mean, nothing is, is black and white, so it totally depends <clears throat> on the individual and what they're doing. So, like, mm-hmm. um, how, I guess I'll start with myself. So, how I try to approach it, especially as someone who works in the industry, and I, yeah, I worked for media outlets before, and now I work at OKX, so the, like, one like the one of the largest, I believe, the second largest by liquidity centralized exchange. Like, what I try to do because first of all, on my Twitter, you know, nothing I say is representative of anything of my job. I mean, I've, if anyone at my at the company is listening to this, you know, like, uh, go ahead and continue ignoring my Twitter. But um, it's like. What I try to do with Ohm, for example, is I just stated when I bought and why. From for like, look with the chart. Like, I'm buying now because it just seems like a good time to buy. And I say, you know, because this thing, I the memes, I think are going to keep going and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then it's like, you know, I can't tell my followers. Not like I have that many, but I can't tell my followers like I'm going to sell exactly at this point with something like Ohm because I don't know. But what I did was when I, I did sell, which was. Uh, pretty much at the top to pat myself on the back when i did sell i was like um uh i just like tweeted that i sold you know i was like this thing i think is just way too loud and i tweeted even like a thread on it on why i sold because it was just way too loud fever pitch like everyone nobody on the timeline will stop talking about it to me that signals it's time to go so like at least i tried to just be transparent about it and i think that's a good approach for other people now when it comes to like um you know the spectrum of of how you become a scammer or whatnot. That's like, you know, you can be all the way on the scam end where you end up getting caught by like Zach XPT, right? <laughs> where it's yeah. like, you're some celebrity influencer. You make some NFT and then you just absolutely rug it, you know? Like <laughs> that's that's like just straight up using your influence and your followers as exit liquidity. Yeah, and yeah I think thank you know you know what you were doing. Are, are like on, on the relatively better end of the spectrum compared to that. Yeah. Like there's this like whole world. I, I find it actually, this is a bit tangential, but I find it kind of funny. Like there's this huge world of, of just flat out rugs and scams. But I feel like most people, at least in my circle of CD, don't are, are are just almost completely unaware of and we really only see through the lens of people like Sat XBT. And it's just like really bad and we just have no exposure to it. But that's kinda of like the normie crypto experience in some sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree. And I think that world is like largely comprised of like dog coins and NFTs. Um NFT is usually like the ones that get rugged from like celebrities that like we never even like hear of because they're just so like garbage or whatever. Um, but like, and that, yeah, because dog coins, that was always the thing. Whenever some like normie friend in my real life would like write me who like, you know, I, I moved out of the US like a decade ago. So I've kept pretty minimal contact with like most of the people I grew up with and went to school with and everything in my small middle of nowhere town where like everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's grandparents. Um, I don't use Facebook or anything like that. So like I keep a, a small circle of who I re- like keep contact with, but sometimes people will still like, like contact me. And, and when they do, it's always asking about like, like Sheeb. Or something like that, you know? And I just tell him, like, I don't know, man. I I just have no, like, nothing to say to you about that because I have no idea. The only thing I can tell you is, like, I do, don't have any. Like, <laughs> you know? Um, but, yeah. So the normie, the normie crypto world gets scammed. Okay, but, okay, so bringing it back, I guess, to the spectrum of, like, um, you know, uh, legitimacy or, like, good intent. Mm-hmm. I do think they're in our space, in the industry space, in the crypto Twitter space, there you do get into that more gray area of like um of of maybe let's say you you iterate on something. So you make an ohm fork or whatever. You you make something that's that's hot at the time, or you make like a new NFT project, right? That yep. you know can get some traction in like crypto Twitter and stuff like that. And 
what I see happen again, I'm not going to name any names or anything like that. And, and I'm not going to say like, I, I wouldn't want to be early because who wouldn't want to be early. But a lot of times what happens is people, they invite their immediate circle of friends, you know, to be in early, to mint early before anybody even talks about it because nobody knows this thing is coming. Nobody, mm-hmm. we're, we're talking about an NFT mint, like a crypto Twitter specific sort of one. Nobody knows this thing is coming. They're just going to like drop it and drop the mint, you know? So everybody who's kind of ready um, can mint. And assuming you can mint, like you're probably going to make a profit. And then, and then you know, you, like you, the memes start and you try to get it going and that sort of thing. And if it gets going, okay, good. If not, uh, whatever, you dump and you made some money. Um, that's one of those games that's like in that gray area that's a bit, bit disingenuous at times. Yeah, it's funny. I recall actually, I, you know, I remember, and I, I think that's that was one of the complaints with uh, Wonderland, right? That uh, Danielle invited all of his friends to buy it to time, you know, before releasing it officially to the public. Yeah. Speaking of Wonderland, um, you had an interview on your Substack with Tuba, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And um, did you guys talk about Wonderland? Um, a, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. I mean, in general, the focus was was on Sifu, and I think he had mm-hmm. a pretty interesting role there. Like, uh, ultimately, yeah, I, I felt like he was getting a lot of flack for the situation that wasn't necessarily deserved. Which is not to say, like, like I think you know, people make valid criticisms that he was probably involved in rugging like hundreds of millions of dollars from Quadriga, uh, for example, like that. You know, like it's not certain. At the same time, I, I think there's a reasonable, you know, like double digit, let's say, probability that he was involved in the meaningful way and that he profited substantially from a illicit or at least less than ideal behavior or, or management of these refunds at Quadriga, right? But ultimately, when it comes to Wonderland, he did not actually take the money. <laughs> like people, people would say over and over again, oh, like, Sifu rugs Wonderland. But he literally just did not. Like, it's on chain. He did not steal the treasury. Matter of fact. You know, you can make more complex allegations. For example, you could claim that he got liquidated with a leveraged position on time as a way to cash out. You could also claim that he they traded the treasury and that that was not ideal governance, which I would also agree with. Um, at the, at the, but however, at the end of the day, you know, it's the, like, ultimately, it was you know I think it was just that the number was going down and people were re- were really angry and it looks for convenient scapegoat and Sifu kind of was that scapegoat, which is not to say I, again I think he was very rightfully removed from one lane. He should not have been part a treasury manager as someone who was involved with Quadriga. I think that's honestly quite ridiculous and reflects pretty negatively on Daniel's judgment. But it is interesting the extent to which CT just immediately and completely turned on Sifu as like the one source of of evil, you know, so to speak, uh, to an extent that I felt was just not really backed up by the facts. Yeah, and I think um, one of the interesting aspects of this event um, is that obviously it got picked up by mainstream media, and the mainstream media. <clears throat> it provides fuel, right, for the kind of ongoing um, regulatory attack, if you will, on the decentralized finance space. Um, with Elizabeth Warren's, you know, sort of notorious, like, shadowy super coders, you know, and all this stuff. Like, <laughs> essentially, you know, the anonymous side of, like, the cryptocurrency industry. Um, so mm-hmm. Maybe sp- more specifically, the anonymous side of DeFi. Um, what... So let, let's let's move on, I guess, to like anonymity. Sure. What I think I think you know, as people in this space, we all value uh, our privacy and anonymity. I mean, if I could be like full anon, I would be, but I just can't because of the nature of my job, and I accept that. So I, I take on more of like a pseudo anonymous role, and that's fine for me because at least it provides sort of like a a first layer of kind of defense or whatever. But um, but you know, I'm normally I'm on camera and stuff like that and whatever. But, um, 
you know, when you have somebody who was involved in like the most high profile <laughs> loss of funds in the centralized exchange space, like ever with Quadriga um, as an anonymous account. So on crypto Twitter that like everyone knew basically, but didn't know it was him and, you know, involved with Wonderland and all that stuff. Um, you know, how do you how do you reconcile this? Well, that's a that's a good question. You know, recon reconciliation of the value of anonymous culture with ultimately the potential for rug pulls. I, I don't have a perfect answer. I think I think this will be something. I think this will be something that we'll see play out. You know, over the course of the next decade, as people figure out exactly what kind of balance is appropriate. I think in practice, the the thing is that you know, in, in practice, most projects, most people, most protocols are well-intentioned. They are not run by ruggers. I would say Wonderland is more of an exception than the norm. You know, there are so many protocols out there run by people who are really genuine, really honest, and who really do want to build, like, protocols like Yearn, protocols like Uniswap, you know, thousands of, of smaller ones. You know, like, like, I don't know, you know, like, you can... Think of many, I'm sure. You know, the team behind Pseudoswap, for example, is, is, is very genuine. And I, I have the highest opinion of them. The team behind the Anas, um, I think most of them, or perhaps all of them, are anonymous. Yet I think the Anala team is probably one of the best teams out there. And I really respect them. Um, so it's really a shame, you know, that these people, that, that this culture of anonymity is tainted by people who either explicitly or implicitly take advantage of anonymity to conceal their past actions and to sort of, you know, not explicitly rug in, in all cases, but sort of soft rug. I think I think that's the fair purpose of one of the essentially soft rug people. Um, I, I guess, to me, the core problem is this culture where people are not sufficiently critical of protocols that are not actually useful or adding value, right? Like people were, when Wonderland was getting really big, and even when, even when Sifu's identity was disclosed and the price had gone down a lot, I saw I would see people just continually come up with just, just justification after justification about why the Wonderland model might have some merit, right? Like why it might work in the future and why one might want to give it a chance. But I think a priori, it just doesn't make sense. Like I think a priori, it's just, purely a redistribu redistributive Ponzi with very little value. Um, and it's, so I think the fundamental problem here is that people are willing to sigh off themselves into believing that something has merit, even when it doesn't, purely because the number of, has gone up and because their investment is non-profit. This, you know, conflation of profit with quality. Yeah. Yeah, and also, mm -hmm. sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. I, I was just going to say, like, this is something that I, to some extent, I try to criticize on Twitter. Like, I try to point out problems and protocols. I try to point out, like, like almost like it's almost like you know the fable of the emperor having the clothes, right? Like, it's it's like if you look at things plainly with an unvarnished eye, you can see quite easily the reality behind these things. It's just people for some reason perhaps for self-interest, perhaps for reasons of conformity, they choose not to, and they propagate this belief that these obviously really bad protocols are adding no value to the ecosystem, or like, you know, genius maneuvers or something when they're just not. And we could just not do that, because these people, a lot of these, like, people are pretty smart on crypto Twitter, um, at least in my circles. They really should know better. Yeah. It's just, I think they get caught, people get caught up in the euphoria of the bull run. And they, exactly. It's it's the you know it's the FOMO, it's the fear of missing out, and it's it's. I mean, I I feel it myself times, of course, too. Like when people, you know, it's like you see people that you know pretty well on crypto, and it's like, oh, they like they made a lot of money like on some like shitcoin trade or whatever, you know, or some some degenerate protocol or whatever and it's like you know it's like that could have been me like i could have done that but i missed it because the window usually the window of opportunity is relatively like closes pretty quickly 
Um, so it's like, yeah, and then it it's easier it's easier to like make these trades, you know, and make money and stuff. Obviously, in a bull market, but we're not really in that at the moment. Um, people can debate if we're in a bear market, bull market, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is like now is not a time where the money is coming easily. So if if you're chasing you know, the next thing that you want to catch like today or you want to catch tomorrow or whatever, the risk is even higher. Um, yep. This things get more degenerate. But, but cycling back real quick to like anonymity too, I also wanted to bring up that I think, I think fears surrounding anonymity are relatively overblown and that the value of, of privacy and anonymity far outweighs the risks. And I would say that because I think our space does a pretty good job of policing itself. And in the event that it doesn't police itself, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to be hard pressed to beat chain analysis. <laughs> so like, you know, if something gets really bad. So, you know, we have people like Zach expertise as an example, but also because it's a relatively small circle, this industry, a relatively closed industry, though it's always getting bigger, um, people talk and, and people end up, when something's getting going wrong or something's going bad or like, you know, things are getting criminal, that sort of stuff, people tend to get exposed. Anonymous people tend to get exposed. Um, and in the event they don't, let's just use an example as a, you know, a large high profile hack or uh, exploit um, of a bridge or a hack of an exchange or whatever. Usually, not always, but usually chain analysis or, or some other government funded <laughs> initiative or whatever ultimately tracks these people down. So, I mean, if you, to be a fully anonymous person in any, even just in life, right. Let alone just online to be a fully anonymous person is an incredibly difficult thing to achieve. I mean, if you really want to do it, you got to like, you got to really like erase yourself from like the internet. You have to like use, um, you got to use more than just like a VPN. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, People yeah. think like, really good point. like if you wanted to have perfect opsec, like I, like you would have to erase every trace of you know personality and just make up a fake identity, obscure a time zone, obscure a background, obscure history. You wouldn't be able like like it. It's it's really hard, and it would really put an imposition on your ability to naturally socialize and connect with others, which then also to some extent naturally poses a limit on on the extent of, to you know how much damage you can do really you know, by ingratiating yourself to others. Yeah, let alone also the fact that which a lot of people, especially I mean we understand it, but a lot of people in the newcomers or in the more retail side of things and normie circles and stuff, they also have a sort of a false belief that. That crypto is like not like inherently anonymous, and it's not really. I mean, like the big the Bitcoin ledger. I mean, it's the blockchain, right? So the Bitcoin yep. ledger is pseudo pseudo anonymous, if anything. Yep. Like, it's like half anonymous because at the end of the day, like unless you unless you like mind you know you mind your Bitcoin with your network set up all private and whatnot. You know what I mean? You never KYZ any address and all that stuff, and yep. you cash out with cash somewhere. You know, it's like you you can do that and that's how you can be private but otherwise like you know again chain analysis is going to find you if they want to because you're never going to erase you're never going to erase your, the blockchain you know um yeah. I, I mean if you were like really good with your tornado hygiene then yeah really but most people are surprisingly not i find this kind of amusing like you know take the index factor for example he just does not give a shit about object he had the worst yeah. object possible <laughs> Which is kind of amazing for a guy that brilliant, right? Like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, the, the moral of the story, right, is it's just really hard. It's really yep. hard if you want to be commit, like, a crime and yeah, be totally. pulling out, let alone just, like, rug pull your followers and then have Zach not <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, all right, moving along, I'm going to open Twitter real quick. There were some questions, some off-topic questions <laughs> people on crypto Twitter wanted to know. Not sure we can read all of them on here, but let's see what we got going on. Scrolling down the timeline. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so DC Builder, friend of the show, he's been on twice. 
He mm-hmm. wants to know about classical music and anime. It's <laughs> a good question. So the recommendation for both, right? So let's see. As far as classical music goes, I think you know it's it's a deeper field than people really appreciate. And I I guess I would first say that it's really important to develop a sort of individual taste by just listening on YouTube. Um, not just the different composers, but also try to listen to different performances and and like think about like what you really enjoy and you know what distinguishes that from other other artists or other composers or other genres you know, within classical. I would say that my personal preference is I, I tend to really enjoy a classical music that's very melodic. And so, for example, in, in that respect, I really enjoyed um, Schubert's works, especially mm-hmm. Schubert's singer works, like his his um, string quartets and the in in particular string quintet. I think they're really quite beautiful. They, honestly, they're like it's, it's a bit funny. They 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 have a sort of angsty feeling to them, which which is maybe not surprising because I think Schubert died pretty young. Uh, nevertheless, I, I I quite enjoy them. Um, his vocal works, uh, for example, his. Uh, cycle with the songs i've always found that a bit of an inspiration as well you know for for singing and for just you know just musically in general the melodic line there is really strong and beyond that i i would say perhaps you know as far as opera goes i think uh, i think wagner is quite accessible especially his ring cycle it's it he uses these uh, late motifs, these small musical motifs that he repeats repeatedly throughout his work, and it, you sort of notice them over and over again. And I think honestly, it, it, they really have a quite powerful emotional effect. Um, the downside, of course, of trying to appreciate Wagner is that you, if you really want to watch the Ring Cycle, that means you're sitting through like twenty six hours of, of opera. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I don't know, like just. Fighters for a weekend or something, and, and get drunk and just have it on. Yeah. And I think people will have fun. Uh, I, uh, on the more contemporary side, I've really, I've really enjoyed Philip Glass, and in particular, I, I enjoy one his earlier work, for example, like his op, his operatic music. Um, he, he has a couple like movie soundtracks that he did that I really like. I enjoy Glassworks as well. I think like a suite, a suite of piano pieces. I've also really enjoyed his violin concerto. Um, something that I've really loved lately is this is is this particular pianist. I think his name is like something Olafsson. Let let me look it up. Olaf. Olaf. Uh, yeah, Viking girl Olafsson and his playing a Philip Glass is really masterful. In particular, his alb- his recording of Glass's Etudes, I would say, is probably one of the best recordings I've ever heard. Like, it's it's that good. But sadly, I feel like Glass has become a bit repetitive in his more recent and his later works. He just sort of uses the same stuff over and over again. And it doesn't really have the same impact as his earlier works, regrettably. Nevertheless, uh, his best is very good. Beyond Word. That, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, Oedipus Rex is also a really nice opera. I think people might, that might be more accessible than the Ring Cycle, actually. Um, and, and as far as anime goes... Well, well before we get to anime, yeah. 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 Um, I, yeah I dig everything you just said. Um, and I wanted to bring up a, a, just a more generic thing, too, and that's like... Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I would recommend anybody listening to this mm-hmm. show to listen to classical music because, like, I, I'm i a bit alarmed maybe that, like, people don't. If even, so when I was finishing my undergrad, so this was, like, 2011, um, I had, like, some, f- like, free credits, like, I had to do or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I did, uh, so I was like, well, I'll take music listening, you know, <laughs> why not? And that's usually like a class a lot of freshmen take, but I, I had missed it. So I was like, well, I'll just take it. It's my last semester. So like, it'll be easy. And I remember like, you know, so this was like a big lecture hall type class, like full of people. And I mean, all you had to do like for homework, you know, was like listen to the mu- the assigned music and then be able to identify it on the exam. Like they would play like a clip and you just had to choose like what it was. So it was incredibly easy. 
And it would, like, blow my mind that, like, you know, these freshmen and stuff in, like, 2010, it's like they, like, couldn't even do that. Like, the simplest <laughs> of assignments. Like, they couldn't even do that. Like, couldn't be bothered. So that was, like, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. I, I listen to classical music every day, mostly when I drive with my son because I take and pick up my son from kindergarten. And it's a short drive. Mm-hmm. And I always listen to classical music in the car with him. And, like, he likes it, you know, because I've just sort of taught him, like, <laughs> it's cool or whatever. Mm-hmm. Try to be based. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> but they, uh, I found a composer that I'd never heard of before because they had like a, some expert on. And again, this isn't in English. I live in Central Europe, so this isn't in English. So I don't understand like everything, but I speak the language. So I get like, mm-hmm. know, let's say 90% of it. But um, uh, Antonin Dvorak, who I believe is Czech. So a Czech composer i'm sure anybody maybe who's like native to central europe might know like who i'm talking about originally but i've never encountered them before but they were playing like some like deep cuts from dvorak and like that was really cool um so that's my my one recommendation for today or whatever for anyway this is a new world symphony is absolutely quite a banger must listen and they played this uh it's called forget me not polka and it's just like a little like it's like a little polka Mm. And I was like, I was like, oh man, yeah, that I mean, that was a banger too. Like, it's like this is. Oh yeah, that's had... kind of really cool. Like, there are a lot of these Hungarian or Central European composers, and and when they incorporate their sort of native or folk music into this more broader tradition of European class classical composition, like you know, like like as you said, this these polkas and these waltzes, I think that stuff is is really interesting and really quite quite high quality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in Budapest, there's the the List Friends uh, Academy, and I had a lot of friends who graduated from there who are fantastic musicians. And then, of course, you know, the airport is also named after List Friends. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I I I listen to um, <laughs> a, a lot. It's called Hungarian Catholic Radio um, mm-hmm. because they just play the best music, and not always they play a lot of classical, but they also play like like deep cuts from just like um these bands of like the <laughs> the how do i describe them? they're like they're like the hungarian beatles let's say like that so they play like that kind of music like during like the soviet era and stuff so they were like these kind of the like, counterculture people but it's very like beatles-esque stuff but they'll like play that and they'll, i don't know they just have a good selection but they play a lot of really really nice like um folk like hungarian folk stuff that has or classical music that has like folk influences and stuff. I I love it. It's just great. Like I love that stuff. That sounds really wonderful. You'll have, you'll have to you have to uh, hit me up with some good recommendations later. I, I, I will. It. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll send you some after this. Also, okay. Yeah, look, <laughs> the listeners are probably like, "That's enough about classical." <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure anyone still hanging on this long wants to hear your <laughs> recommendations. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So for anime, that's the that's a good. It's it's really hard to recommend anime because it really encompasses so many different um, genres, right? I guess you know from a dramatic perspective, I think if you're really into like well plotted structure and like a and like a you know tight plot and good characterization and like a really nice narrative structure, I think one general principle I have is that if you're looking for that kind of stuff. Anime that are adapted from light novels are not always, but but sometimes really a cut above the rest. And a good example is Shin Sekai Yuri from the New World, and that's a really really good sci-fi story that was pu- originally published as like I think a two or three volumes set of novels, and not even light novels, just straight up like sci-fi novels, and then adapted into anime. Um, it's it's an original setting. The characters are really sympathetic. It's really tightly plotted. It's super exciting. I would recommend it for anybody. Um, beyond that, I, I tend to enjoy anime that are really kind of unconventional or sort of out there or just very experimental from an, art- an artistic perspective. In that respect, I think Ikuhara's works are really great, especially uh, Penguin Drum. Penguin Drum is it's one of those anime where you're kind of thrown into the deep end from the very beginning. You don't really know what's going on. You, you, like, there's no, like, you know, character who will dump exposition on you. Rather, it's almost as though you're just observing a narrative play out. 
um, and you have to figure out exactly what's going on. And personally, I, I really love that. You know, I I found it super exciting, and it's really really fun to just watch the show and sort of be in this perpetual state of confusion. And then by the end of the series, you kind of have a, have some sense of what's going on. And if you choose to rewatch it, you know, like two or three times, you get it every time. There's you, you get more and more. You notice more and more things, and you get a better understanding of what's going on. Let's see, what what other anime do I like? Uh, that, that's that's a good question. I mean, I've, I've watched, you know, on order of, like, 200, which is not, not as many as a big D, I think, but still a fair number. Um, I, I'm pretty picky with comedy, so some anime I find are really funny, whereas some anime, some anime sort of fall flat on me. Um, the Daka Box is one that I found really quite hilarious. Um, from a dramatic perspective, I think the plot is quite exciting. And then beyond that, it, it layers on some very effective uh, comic gags, which personally, I, I, I absolutely love it. Um, unfortunately, uh, it seems to have not been that well received. Ultimately, I'm not sure there'll be a third season. But uh, hey, that's uh, 24 episodes for you to check out if you're a fan. Have you... uh? Checked out Big D Senpai's um, anime watch list. I just looked at it earlier this morning. It's insane. That guy has watched everything, man. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Again, it's for the listeners, Big, Big D was on our most our episode prior to this. So um, check that Thank out after the talk. Well. You know, life goals. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like looking at it yesterday and I was like, how could I... <laughs> how could I consume all of this? <laughs> you know, like how could I do it? I start um, early. Start ten years ago. Yeah. But see, I'm just um, looking for my list now. Some some names I just talked really for all. um uh Zombie Land Saga, really, really funny. I absolutely love it. It's it's hilarious about you know a zombie idol group. I I found it just like roll on the ground hilarious. Uh let's see. I just watched, actually, just, I think this weekend, I watched Knights of Sidonia. I thought that was a really, really good sci-fi series. I, uh, in a, a week before that, I had read some of Tsutomu uh, Nihei's manga, especially his uh, the Country of Dolls manga. I had read a couple volumes of that and really liked it. So I decided to check out Knights of Sidonia, and it didn't really, it, it certainly did not uh, fail to live up to expectations much different from a typical settings and really quite moving in some ways, I think. Um, I, I, I guess there's one anime that I've never really been able to get into that some people really like. That some people really like Bakke Monogatari and in general, and in general the Monogatari series. And I've never really been able to get into that because it feels like watching them, it feels like I, I, I'm like forced to expend cognitive effort to watch all the little like puns and interstitial jokes and and sort of follow the whole thing, and for some reason it feels more like work than like fun. But I I, I don't know. Some some people really like it. It's it's not quite my thing though. So yeah. word. Um, some more rapid fire questions for you. So ZRX Llama intern wants to know who would be your CT significant other, and uh, why, well, is it, why is it them? <laughs> That's like that's an embarrassing question. I mean, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I'd have to go myself with Bulma, though everyone would say Bulma, <laughs> but I'm a, I'm actually allowed to say Bulma because I was Bulma's like third follower and Bulma will back me up on that so that's really impressive <laughs> yeah 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 I found I don't know how I came across Bulma's profile I have no I don't remember but it was the day Bulma was created and I was just like I don't even know Bulma might have had like one tweet or something and I just like followed and was like and this was right after I had like called my following list and like deleted a bunch of people and I was just like I was just like Everyone follow Bulma, you know, and first night, you know, when you, yeah. when you know, you just know. 
Yeah, yeah. And we've been friends ever since. Boom is awesome, great. by the way. Everyone should that's, follow. that's great. I, I, I love to hear it. Um, let's see. who. Uh, what else? Food and cheese pairings. That's a good question. I mean, typically, this is sort of funny for someone who loves cheese so much, but I, I actually don't generally pair food with cheese. I, I think that's sort of a really complex, multi-dimensional question. And, and actually, because my appreciation of wine is relatively limited, uh, I, I generally tend to appreciate cheese um, by itself, or but with bread rather than as a pairing with particular foods. Um, that being said, I, I really love cheese. I guess I don't really have time to go through any single cheese recommendation, but if, if I had to recommend one cheese, I, I guess, okay, fine, I'll, I'll give two recommendations. Um, if people want to branch out to something just a little bit more experimental, I would recommend going for Brie Fermier, which is important from France. Um, I mean, so this is targeted for an American audience, but I'm sure it's exported elsewhere as well. So Brie Fermier, I think from the firm de Juvence in, in France, they have a really good Brie. And the thing is that in America, you can buy brie in every grocery store, but it's generally very bad. And I don't really know why, but I think it has to do with certain requirements with regard to pasteurization of the milk. Um, and even if you import brie, most of those brie's are subject to very strict pasteurization requirements, which especially kill the flavor. It, it, it just tastes like plasticky to me. However, I don't know how to do it, but Brie Fermier just has a very wonderful, mushroomy, savory, incredibly complex flavor. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you want to go for something more extreme, I would recommend trying a particular blue cheese called Roquefort Papillon. Um, not just for Roquefort, you can find Roquefort in any grocery store, but if you can find Roquefort Papillon specifically, it comes in this sort of like black foil wrapping. That is absolutely one of the, my favorite cheeses. It is the best blue cheese I have ever had, um, period. It's, it is, it's just so intense. Um, and this is going to sound sort of degenerate, but I, I'll just like eat chunks of Roquefort Papillon by itself. Um, and this is like a super strong, super savory blue cheese. It's just filled with those wonderful uh, crystals of protein. Um, You're making me yeah. hungry now. Yeah. Try on bread. <laughs> have it. Have it by yourself. Put it in salad. It's it's good. And um, yeah, isn't it like? Because uh, again, it's been so long since I've lived in the states. Isn't it like illegal to like sell like raw milk? Like you can't like go buy raw milk, right? I mean, I guess you could go to a farmer and probably do it, but but yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Or at least something approximately close to that is true, which is a shame in my opinion. Yeah, here you can just like in some place, you know, there's like machines, you know, and you can just yeah. like go get raw milk like from a machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, like yeah. The, I've seen the grocery stores, there's like you know, like semi pasteurized milk, and it does seem better. But I, I always wonder, like, what am I missing out on? Yeah, you know, I'm always tempted to like go to a farm somewhere and just get the real thing, you know, because it seems so satisfying. Yeah, and you know, and I'm jealous of you, man. It's good and stuff. I'm certainly not. I back home, I have a a guy. He graduated with my my older sister from high school and stuff, and then he was my my track and field coach. And mm -hmm. but he is a he's a dairy farmer. And I lied when I say I don't use Facebook. I have Facebook, but I don't use it. But like every once in a while, I'll just hop on to see if anybody wrote me something or whatever. But his. <laughs> He's, like, one of the only people I still follow because I just, like, unfollow them. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm still friends with them. I just unfollow them. But yeah, I yeah. still follow him. And he posts, like, really thoughtful, really, like, like high-quality posts about being a dairy farmer and stuff. And sometimes he talks about the, the, um, the benefits of, like, raw milk and how, like, you know, the regulation and control over, over this stuff is, like, very misguided and, mm -hmm. and sort of disingenuous in itself because – those out of health benefits. My understanding, I guess, is that the, the problem with raw milk is that it's like, I mean, you have to have it fresh, right? And from a, you know, a yeah. healthy cow. So like you, that's why, that's why I, when I go to the store or whatever, I just buy like UHT milk. It's like the long, long shelf life milk, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just like, I'll buy milk 
and it'll just go bad like so quick. Like I can't drink it fast enough. So I imagine if yeah. I had like raw milk in the fridge, like you gotta like, <laughs> it's pre- I'm pretty sure it's like bad in like a day. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's definitely a broad question about like animal welfare conditions, right? Like, for example, something I, I I really love. So I really love chicken sashimi, and the thing is that chicken sashimi, like any American, will find the idea just repulsive because they're conditioned to believe that chicken necessarily, that raw chicken necessarily comes like inundated with salmonella. Salmonella, that's yeah. not the case. It's only this. It's only this way because. All the chicken that's easily available in the U.S. comes from these factory farms where chicken is raised in absolutely filthy conditions. Whereas if you store your chicken properly, especially in, in like Japan, where chicken sashimi is a more common dish, the chicken are not just constitutively infected with salmonella, right? Because they just, they're in healthy conditions, sanitary conditions, they're treated well. Um, however, you know, if you if you have to feed like millions, hundreds of millions of people with a huge amount of eggs and milk, you know, and these people are demanding super low prices, then you do, I guess, inevitably end up with factory farmed animals, right? Which, and by necessity, that has to be subject to some pretty strict uh, pasteurization requirements. Otherwise, everyone is actually just gonna get sick, unfortunately. Yeah, again, I'm I'm certainly no expert in this field, um, but I wonder, you know, I again when I was an undergrad, I had to watch like one of those factory farming movies or whatever, mm-hmm. and I was like naturally repulsed, you know, for yeah. a period mm-hmm. of time. And then I kind of just got over it and kept buying <laughs> or whatever. But like, um, but I do wonder, like, I have a hard time believing, considering the sheer amount of space, you know, in the United States, especially in the the Midwest, where there's not a lot of people, but a lot of space Mm -hmm. that's primarily government subsidized corn. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, I have a hard time believing, like, we, like, the United States could not feed itself on not factory farm stuff. Because, um, again, not an expert, and I'm not saying where I live, because I don't know, but where I live in Central Europe, like... There's no factory farms or something, but I'm confident it's better Um, just because there's higher standards and stuff like there's, you know, we don't have like GMOs, like Mm -hmm. there's no GMOs. And, um, and I just, I'm under the impression that in like places like Hungary and stuff, there aren't these huge, large scale factory farms, though there might be, again, don't quote me on that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just under the impression it's a bit better, but either way, I I know. I'm not a huge expert on the state of the ladder. And, and to be clear, I'm not exactly a purist. I really like, I, I'll, I'll happily go to the grocery store and I will buy the cheapest chicken available and I will <laughs> very happily eat it. And then knowing that it's factory farm, like I, I am not at all a, a purist when it comes to this. You know, but, but yeah, I, 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 I do wonder, you know, it, it's true. We have a lot of space. So well, like what's, what's going on? You know, I, I don't quite understand. And it might just be a question of like scale and profitability. Maybe the economics just for some reason don't work out. Because like in the US, I guess the cost of living is higher. And you know, over time the US has transitioned to largely a service economy and so people ultimately face a pretty high um just baseline cost of living, right? Um and a consequence of that is that Physical labor, especially things like running farms, that is relatively less competitive in this sort of economy, and so they might have to resort to measures that have that are more you know, sort of cutthroat or efficient, right? But that's just pure speculation. I yeah, would be fully off the base. Yeah. yeah, I think the where I would push back a little bit on that maybe is that unless things have radically changed in the past decade, which I don't really think they have. I'm pretty sure, like, most of the major food brands that you uh, come across in any American supermarket, I'm pretty sure, like, almost all of them are owned by, like, I don't know, like, three to five companies. Um, That's a good point. <laughs> so, I, and I'm sure, you know, we're talking about, like, uh, it's like, I don't know, like Nestle, right, Kellogg's, like, ty- like Tyson yeah, yeah. Chicken or something. I can't remember all of them exactly. But either way, it's a small, a small monopoly on food and, like... I mean, I'm sure these people are raking in the profits no matter what. And I'm, I'm sure if, uh, you know, there was enough 
market demand or whatever, <laughs> they could still be highly profitable with like more ethically, uh, mm-hmm. ethical and humane treatments probably. But again, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm no purist. I just buy whatever. Um, but you know, it's like, I, I read Sapiens, you know, and he talks about like yeah. the most life on this planet is like in a cage, you know, like factory farmed, like that, the right. most just right. life on the planet is like that. And it's like a miserable existence for any kind of animal. And it's like, that's just an objective reality. That's unfortunate, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, and, you know as, as a country, you know, America is a country with great wealth, right? So you would think that people, like, you know, if you're like a poor African, then, then whatever, like, but if you're a rich American, then it does seem, you know, like, like it's not impossible to imagine a world where Americans pay a slight premium in, in terms of the food costs that they experience, right? For what might be a pretty meaningful increase in animal welfare. And I think that would probably be a good thing. So I... But uh, I don't know. I guess people just don't actually demand this and practice market forces. So yeah. And I think that's a bit of a shame, you know. Yeah. And again, <laughs> can I keep, we have both, I keep quantifying, not an expert, but like, I, I don't know what's going on with the corn situation either. I just know that the government has historically like had these corn subsidies. So that's why like the entire Midwest and like everywhere in the United States is like corn. Like, yeah, it's super subsidized. And I think that causes a lot of weird distortions. I don't know exactly what the distortions are, but my intuition is that whatever the market distortions are, they're not they're probably not good. Yeah, because it's like because then you just end up I mean it's presumably for corn syrup, right? So then it's yeah. like and then corn syrup finds its way into like everything. Like everything in the United States has corn syrup in it. Like diapers and stuff, like everything has corn syrup. It's it's just mind blowing. Yeah, it's pretty weird. I mean, like, in a sense, it's great that we can make, that we can turn corn syrup and, like, diapers. Like, I honestly think it's an issue that corn syrups and diapers, but it, it is an issue that Americans are, are kind of a way and, and the proliferation of pretty unhealthy processed foods and a lack of general willingness to cook is less than ideal. I, I would like it if people were not getting diabetes on a, on a, yeah, right. Scale. And I'll check for the sake of science. I'm sure I still have an old package of diapers from when my kid was a baby or somewhere. And I'll, uh, I'll check and see if there's corn syrup in the, the European variety. Industrial, <laughs> yeah, industrial ingenuity. Yeah. Um, oh, and okay. And then the last question, I guess, is, uh, is about you getting a better microphone. <laughs> I'll do it eventually. Look, if your firm gets to five figures, like Arthur Hayes really says it well. I'll consider it. No, but seriously, I yeah. will. Have time more, but I really should. Well, Sam Bankman Fried still doesn't have a great mic last I knew, so he's doing all right. See? Looks, well, yeah, that's. Oh, well, that's Sam, you know. He's the weird guy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. Um, yeah, we've gone over an hour. Great stuff. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm really glad you came on. Thanks. Likewise, I, I I hope I didn't ramble too much, um, but it was a lot of fun for me. So thank you. Oh no, it was great. I think I think if anybody rambled, it was probably me. To be honest, <laughs> I probably wasn't the best host. Um, yeah, no, it was it was great. Thank you. I really appreciate the, the invitation. It was a great time. Yeah, man. Anytime. Come on again sometime. Um, is there anything else you want to say just before we sign off? Yeah, I, th- I think I'm all good for now. Just. You know, you know, I'm I'm always happy to hear from from people if they have any questions, comments. I know I, I enjoy meeting new people. I enjoy chatting with people. So just hit me up anytime. You know. Cool. Um. Yeah, and we'll have your twitters and stuff like uh on screen for anyone watching. We'll have it in the descriptions and whatnot. Um. For anyone who's just listening, follow at zero x fbi femboy. And right, so um, this has been Send It, the official blockchain and cryptocurrency podcast by OKX Insights. Um, as always, like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell on YouTube. That stuff always helps the algos. Um, drop comments if you ever want us to talk about stuff. Hit us up on Twitter. That's probably e- the easiest way, especially if you hit me up directly on Twitter. Um, if you ever want to see someone on the show or any questions, comments, whatever um 
if you're listening on your podcast service of choice, then just do the same stuff like share with your friends, all that stuff. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Um, thanks again to FBI Fanboy for coming on. My name's Adam, and until next time. Thank you.